Thanks, ladies. It's so cool to be here with a room full of wombs. <laughs> so yeah, I have a real passion to see uh, people step into a place of healing and wholeness. Um, and as a counselor, I hear stories, I see the impact of lies, um, and my heart is to, is to journey with people, to give them tools to better understand why they think, feel, and behave the way they do. Um, but I want to start off this evening by asking you all a question. How many of you have ever felt forgotten? A sense of being ignored or maybe unseen, overlooked, snubbed, disregarded, invisible, unimportant, silenced, immaterial, insignificant, irrelevant. Maybe it's because of friends or family or spouses or maybe even with God. Well, let me ask you a little bit differently. How many of you have feared that you're going to be forgotten? Feared that, you know, maybe I don't actually matter to this person or, or that person. Or, or maybe I, I, I kind of matter too much. Maybe I am too much. Or, or maybe I'm not enough. And so this fear causes this potential of pain, which can often even paralyze us in our ability to walk and relate with others. The potential of getting hurt or rejected just triggers and deepens this fear. You see, being forgotten or invisible is actually one of the most painful of human experiences because we are wired for connection. And so the idea of showing vulnerability and need and then the what if I do and I'm still rejected. Many years ago when I lived in London, I was running for a train and I uh, ran past this homeless guy and he shouted out for a coffee and I'm like, oh dude, I'm gonna miss my train. Well, I ended up missing the train, so I got two cups of coffee and I thought I'd just go hang with this dude while I waited for the next train. And I ended up talking to him for six hours that day. I missed lectures, um, which was fun. But um, I was asking him about his life story and you know what it was like being homeless and his experiences. And he said to me, you know, the pain of hunger or homelessness or being cold is nothing in comparison to the pain of being ignored or unseen or that feeling of I'm forgotten, that I don't matter. And now when I was thinking about this, you know, as women, we're, we are nurturers by nature, you know, to be connected and to, and to kind of be seen is, is everything that kind of drives us. And I think this is why this kind of experience wounds and injures us so much. And I don't know about you, but sometimes we can almost spend hours ruminating, mulling over these kind of thoughts around maybe I'm not enough, maybe I'm not important enough, maybe I'm unlovable, maybe there's something wrong with me. It's in this space in our minds that actually we're most vulnerable to attack. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 says this, we destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God and we capture rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. When I, when I teach my boys about this, I talk about playing cops and robbers because the Bible says we need, to play, we need to be the cop to the robber of our minds. And when you look at the root word of this word thought, rebellious thoughts, the root word for that word thought is neoma, which means a mental thought with a specific evil purpose. I don't know if you've ever watched movies like Braveheart, where the enemy would get an arrow, they would dip it in fire, light it, I mean dip it in fuel, light it, and then shoot it into the thatch of the enemy's house with the intention of burning the house from the top down. And that's exactly how the enemy works. It says we must, we must put up our shield of faith so we can hold it up against the, the fiery attacks of the enemy. 2 Corinthians 11 says that, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. That word scheme is the same word neoma as that word, first one, capturing rebellious thoughts. So the way, the way the enemy works is anytime you go through any circumstances or experience of life, he's constantly throwing fiery arrows, rebellious thoughts, schemes at your mind to attack your identity and your worth. Because his job is to destroy you. 
And I imagine even when Roxy was doing her modeling career and she spoke around this idea of believing her value was based on what she did. And that is the biggest scheme lie the enemy wants you to believe, that who you are is based on how you behave or how somebody else behaves towards you. So if somebody rejects you, we don't look at the behavior of rejection, we internalize it as, into this idea that there's something wrong with me. Their behavior becomes who I am. You know, the only power one of these thoughts have over you is if you agree with it. The second you agree with a thought, you turn it into a belief, and it robs. It robs from the joy of living because our minds become obsessed with fears, or, or it'll rob you from the potential of a deepening relationship because you're going to put up defenses because you're afraid that if I allow someone in, they're going to just reject me, and it robs you from the freedom of just being you because of this fear and this doubt that actually I'm not enough. For so many of us, we'd rather hide our fears, hide our needs, hide our insecurities. Our instinct is to be there for everybody else. But our fear is to hide ourselves when we have needs. Um, it's so interesting, when, when a person reaches out to care for somebody else, it actually puts them in the position of feeling powerful because they're in control. They're the one that's actually offering the help. But when you have a need, the, the idea of revealing that need puts you in a position of feeling out of control, powerless. Because what if, what if I reach out and expose my need and I'm rejected? The idea of experiencing that is way too painful. I know that pain of forgotten. I've experienced it with my mom and, and sometimes in friendships and, and in my head, I know that 99.9% of the time, it's not intentional. It's our hurts, not our heart, that hurt people. And there have been times where there have just been little things that have happened, you know, where people have disappointed you or maybe they've forgotten to connect with you or do something. And often we reply back saying, oh, don't worry about it. It's fun. And recently a friend turned around and said to me, Mads, it's actually not fun because what you feel matters. About three weeks ago, I was ministering at another church in Howick and, uh, and KZN, and um, during the worship, it was one of those God moments where it felt like a beam of light came down from Mars or something, and it was like, God just zapped me, and I just, it was almost like he took a piece of scar tissue off my heart to expose an emotion that I thought was fun. I just kind of brushed it off, and he goes, no, this emotion needs to be dealt with. And it's in this process of kind of this lifting of this emotion that I found myself for 10 days straight sobbing my eyes out. I'd wake up in tears. When I thought about putting on worship, I would cry. During worship, I'd cry. If I thought about the worship I just listened to, I'd cry. My husband started thinking I was going through menopause. He's like, what's the matter with you? I'm like, I don't know, I just can't stop crying. And I just cried and cried and cried. And I was like, my gosh, this is getting ridiculous because there wasn't anything significant but it was almost like God was going, the emotion that you've just, those little things that you've just pushed aside and pushed aside, that emotion matters to me. And he led me to this verse in Isaiah 49, verse 15. He says this, can a mother forget the infant at her breast and walk away from the baby she has born? And the answer is likely not, because as I said, for women it is in our nature to nurture, but it is possible that sometimes a woman can be so broken to the point where her ability, her natural ability becomes blurred or unnatural and she forgets her child. And I know the pain of that. And I believe that there might be many who themselves know that pain of being deeply hurt through being forgotten. And the idea of trusting in God the Father almost just feels beyond our scope. But here's God's response to this verse. He says this, though she may forget, I will never forget you. What God intimately reminded me of in my journey recently is that every pain, every emotion, every hurt, every betrayal, no matter how big or small, matters to him. 
Psalm 56 verse eight says, you keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected all my tears. He probably collected a whole lot two weeks ago in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. You see, God's nurturing compassion infinitely exceeds that of the most tenderest parental heart towards their child. And the reason why I wanna start here this evening is because I fully believe that we serve a God who is totally able to do incredibly amazing things in our lives. But I know that there are many women that are walking around with limps. They are petrified to allow themselves to believe that actually God is truly for them. Because that pain of being forgotten is too great. And so the first point that I want you to hold on to is that it's actually impossible to walk in the full ability of God's power for you when you don't trust in his nurturing heart. Many years ago when I was studying to become a counselor, I was a third year student and we would often have these practical weekends. We would go away uh, and allow God to deal with stuff in our lives. And uh, it was one of those weekends, and I was at a place in my, in my life where I was so ready for God to, to kind of do stuff. I was like, yes, I'm, I'm amped to meet God. I'm going to bring my stuff for him, and he's going he's gonna to do an incredible healing. And I was, just, I was just willing and available. And so on the Friday evening, we arrived at the venue, and the lady that was running the event, there was only about 14 of our students, she said, like, you know, who wants to go first? And I'm like, choose me. Like, I'm amped, you know. And she, she kind of looked around the room and, and chose somebody else. I was like, okay, it's a bit weird, but anyway. Saturday morning came, and she's like, who wants to go first? And I'm like, choose me, you know? And again, she ignored me and chose somebody else. And I was getting a little bit like, oh, I don't really like this feeling, but okay. Third session, who wants to go next? I wasn't so excited, but I was like, I'm still willing. Ignored me again. Fourth session, I was like, <laughs> Fifth section. <laughs> By that evening, this rage started to rise. You see, emotion is a funny thing. It's got no concept of time. If you're experiencing rejection now, but you've experienced rejection and forgottenness in the past and you've never processed it, it's almost like an emotional tsunami gets triggered in the present. It just accumulates and kind of, and that evening I was sitting in the canteen, pushing my food around, I was angry, I was ruminating in my mind, you know, God, like, here I am, I'm ready, and you just let me down, like every other person in my life has let me down, and I, you know, I'm so angry, and I was furious, and one of my lecturers came and sat down at the table by me, and. She could see I wasn't in a good place, and she was trying to, you know, I don't know what she was saying to me. I wasn't really paying attention, but she was trying to minister to me or speak to me, and eventually, I kind of just stuck my head on the table. I was kind of hoping if I, if I did that, she might get the message and just go away, because, you know, I'm just angry. And, um, and while I'm sitting there with my head on the table, God says to me, Mads, look at your thumbs. And I was holding my thumbs like this. He says, whenever you are fearful or feeling rejected or, or feeling uh, you know, ignored, you start to self-comfort. You push people away and you've learned to just depend on yourself because in your mind you're telling yourself that no one else can be trusted. And then he said to me, I want you to ask this lecturer of yours to hold your thumbs. <laughs> I was like, you've got to be kidding me. That's just so embarrassing. Like, and we had a little bit of an argument about it, and he's like, no, seriously, you need to know what it feels like to be able to ask somebody else, be vulnerable before somebody else, to hold on to you when you're not in a good place. So without lifting my head, because I was just too embarrassed, I stuck up my thumbs, and I said, God told me that you got to hold my thumbs. <laughs> kind of like cringing. And she took hold of both my thumbs and something inside of me cracked. And I sobbed and I sobbed and I sobbed. I sobbed myself to sleep. I woke up at about 10 o'clock that evening. She's still holding onto my thumbs. And I was like, so embarrassed. But there was this like, this healing that had happened, the stuff that had, like, the pus came out, the hurt, the pain, everything came out. And I kind of was like, you know, thanks for that. <laughs> Took my thumbs back. <laughs> And um, the next morning when I went into the, the session, the, the lady who was running it said, hey, you know, Mads, God actually told me not to choose you 
because he had a different plan. And, and she said, if you want to come up, I'm like, no, don't worry. It's cool. God sorted me out last night. It's all good. And um, it was about three, four months later, the same set of students, they didn't know what had happened. We were all were doing another practical kind of event. I don't know. What we, I can't remember where we were. But anyway, we were all given a lump of clay. And we were told to prayerfully consider what we would make with this lump of clay for the person sitting on our left. Don't ask me what I made for the person on my left. I have no idea. But there was the guy, the guy that was sitting on my right or his left. Uh, he was this guy called Angelo. He was the only dad and father on the course. He was this big kind of Italian guy. And um, God told him to take the lump of clay and to squeeze it and make a mold of the inside of his hand. And uh, I didn't see him making it, but he, you know, when we had to exchange lumps of clay, he gave me this, this kind of thing. And I was like, what is this? He said, no. God told me specifically that you needed something new to hold on to and that you needed to have the impression of a father's hand to hold on to. And the reason why I share this story is because I believe there are some here tonight that need hope handles to hold on to of the goodness of God the Father who intimately knows each one of you by name, every hair on your head, every wound in your heart, and he wants to meet you where you are. And my hope as I share the story is that it will give you courage to invite him into those most painful spaces because I know without a shadow of a doubt that he will meet you where you are. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we could ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. And I wanna draw your attention to the three words, is able and power. And when we look at the Greek of those words, is able, is the word daname, which is an, an inherent ability because of the power one has. And the word power is dynamas. So it's kind of literally, they're kind of almost sibling words. They're so close in their meaning. And dynamas means an inherent power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. In other words, what the scripture is trying to say is that God has an inherent ability to do what his inherent power allows him to do by virtue of his nature. I mean, to simplify it, he has the ability and the power to do what's already in his heart for you. And his heart is to connect with you because he's a restorer. So there are three things that I want you to walk away with knowing today. The first is this. God is able to meet you where you are. So often we think he doesn't know where I am. He can't hear my prayers. He can't see me. He doesn't know what's going on in my heart. But I want you to know that God is able to meet you where you are. There's a story in scripture about a woman who lived a life of avoiding others because of her own shame. See, shame is an identity crippling emotion that causes us to hide. And so she chose to hide from people. She chose a life of being forgotten because it was too painful to face others in case she received rejection. And it's a story of the woman at the well. And in biblical times, it was quite well known that if a, if a Jew was traveling from Jerusalem to Galilee, they would willingly take a three-day detour, and they're walking here, there's no taxis, buses, or greyhounds, they would take a three-day detour to get to Galilee just to avoid going through Samaria because they were people that they would rather forget and not engage with. And John 4 verse 4 says this, it's talking about Jesus, now he had to go through Samaria. So immediately I asked myself, why? Why did he have to go? I mean, was he late for an urgent appointment? Did he have a, you know, a preaching ministry the next day and so he couldn't take a three-day like, detour? Scripture doesn't tell us anything that he was like late for something or needed to be somewhere. But what it does tell us is that it leads him to a story of a woman who experienced what it means to live forgotten. And he engaged with her there. It reveals that God makes appointments to meet you where you are. Why? Because he's able to. 
and he wants to. It's in his heart. It's in his capacity. It's his, it's, he wants to find you. He wants to comfort you. He wants to connect with you because you matter to him. And no matter where you're hiding, even if it's at a well in the middle of the day, he will find you because his heart is about restoration and bringing you into healing and wholeness. The second point I want you to know is that God is able to restore you according to his plan that he has for you. His heart is to put you back together. He's in the restoration business. Listen to the scripture in Psalms 18 verses 20 to 24. This is the message version. It's such a beautiful description of God's heart. It says this, God made my life complete when I placed all the pieces before him. When I got my act together, he gave me a fresh start. Now, I am alert to God's ways. I don't take God for granted. Every day I review the way he works. I try not miss a trick. I feel put back together and I'm watching my step because God rewrote the text of my life when I opened the book of my heart to his eyes. Did you know that God has a blueprint to your original design? That when God was dreaming about you, he started doodling. He was like, who's this person going to be? And he's dreaming about you. And he's, he's kind of imagining how he's going to create you. Because Psalm 139 verse 16 says this. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. There's a book up in heaven in God's heart with your name on it with your story in it. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. For some of us, we sit there thinking, nobody gives me a second thought. God thought about you so much that he even wrote your story in his book. Because you were dreamed of by a dreamer. You were created by a creator. You were planned by a planner. You were built by a builder. You were designed by a designer. You were sculpted by a sculptor. And you were knit by a knitter. If that doesn't speak your value, then I don't know. And we need to grow in a confidence of understanding that even though there was an original design and I was born into a broken world that maybe caused injuries and hurts and pains that have resulted in me walking in a limp, and now we think I'm so far off from what I was originally designed, it's almost like getting a Lego masterpiece. My boy loves building Lego and he gets the booklets and you know, sometimes he builds it and then something happens and he drops it and it shatters into a thousand pieces. But the good news is he can go back to the book and figure out where all these pieces belong and that's what it's like with God. When we bring those pieces of our lives back before him, he can put us back together again. It's not something we have to do by ourselves. It's something that all we need to do is bring the pieces to him. And he's a good God. The third thing I want you to hold on to is that God is able to empower you to walk in the fullness of the plan he has for you. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You see, so many of us think, okay, God can heal me, he can do my heart, but he can't use me, like who am I? He uses other people that are already on a stage or whatever it is. And often people think, you know, Madge, you've got, you know, you're confident and you're this and you're that and God's using you in amazing ways. But what they don't see is where my journey started. In brokenness, in insecurity. I was so insecure, I would stutter. I had to go for execution lessons. It felt more like elocution lessons. No, what's it? Exec the other way around, that's my dyslexia kicking in. You know what I'm saying. I was a G class kid, and G didn't stand for good grades. It's like A class, B class, C class, skip a few, and stick mads in the G class. I barely passed my trick. I became a hairdresser because I couldn't get into varsity, so I could just do a trade. I got into varsity later on in my life, not because of my grades, because of my age. You're a mature student. <laughs> I'll tell you something, one of my lectures, one of my classes that our modules I did was called evangelicism. I thought it was a posh word for evangelism. It wasn't. Halfway through the semester, I'm like, I have no idea what they're talking about. But in my mind, I still used to believe 
how can God use me? I'm nothing. I'm stupid. I can't speak properly. I'm insecure. I, I don't know big words. And a friend once said to me, if God can use a donkey, you can use anyone. I'm like, okay, well, there's, I've got a bit of hope here, you know? <laughs> and the point is this. All God wants from you is to be faithful to the step that he's shining right in front of you. That's it. When I think back over my life, where I am today in my ministry is beyond what I could have ever asked for or imagined. It blows my mind. I still sit there thinking, I still can't believe he's using me to do this. Like, can somebody pinch me? Like, this is not happening. But if you're just faithful to the step in front of you, and maybe the step in front of you right now is to just be willing to say, hey, God, I wanna bring my deepest hurt for you so that you can heal it. Because once you heal it, then I can step into the fullness of being able to walk the way you designed and created me to do. So whatever it is that God is calling you, Step into that space. So as we wrap up, three things. Open the doors of your heart. Bring your fears and your hurts and your pain to the healer. For others, maybe, it's to align your mind to understand your actual value. Psalm 139, 13 to 14 said this. You made, say you made. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you, Lord, for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well do we know it? Here's the point. Do you know your made bar label? We often look at the label and clothing to consider its worth and its value. But forget Gucci or Prada, you were made by the Father. And finally, start living faithful to the step that he lights up in front of you. He has a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And all you need to do is daily ask him, Lord, what are you wanting me to do with my today? Because Ephesians 2.10 says that you are his masterpiece. He has created in you and you so that you can do good things that he has planned for you long ago. And I promise you, when you start walking in his plan, it leads to liberated living. And so I want you to stand with me. We're gonna have a song that is gonna be sung to you. And when I was preparing for today, I felt like God say that he wants to have a father-daughter moment with his girls. He wants to sing over you. He wants to, he wants to dance with you. And so as you hear the song, this is not a song that you're gonna worship to him. This is a song you're gonna receive from your dad as he sings over you promises and pulls you into a place of intimacy with him. And so whether you wanna raise your hand and hold on to his or dance with him or whatever it is or bring him those pains in your heart or choose today to say, I'm gonna walk in faithfulness, trusting that you've got a plan for my life, whatever it is, I encourage you that as you spe step into this space, that you just surrender to him because he is a good, good father. Amen. Thank you so much for watching our YouTube channel. We really pray that it, you find it helpful in your journey. And we also really want to encourage you to take your next step by signing up to join a small group or to do discovery. Thanks again for watching and don't forget to subscribe and share this with as many people as possible. And we really can't wait to see you next Sunday.